Hello and welcome to Jason's Macintosh Museum. I'm Jason, your host, of course. <laughs> and what we're looking at today is the Macintosh Portable from 1989. Now, as the name implies, this is the very first, well, portable Macintosh. And by portable, really what that means is that it was the first Macintosh model that supported battery power and could be used away from AC power. But when you think about it, the Macintosh portable came in rather late in the portable computer uh, market because by the late 80s, you could buy any number of portable battery powered laptop machines from vendors such as Compaq, um, AST, um, Toshiba and, and many others. So the question has to be asked, why did the Macintosh Portable come out so late in the game? Well, I think it was Apple really watching and waiting to see how portable technology was evolving because their view at the time was that portable computers, battery powered computers really had two main problems. One was the battery life. At the time, most portable computers used uh, NICAD batteries, which didn't give you very long battery life and often had issues with uh, the memory effect, where of course, if you don't discharge them all the way, they then won't hold a full charge, etc. And the other issue was the screen technology because in the 1980s and the late 80s, laptops would either have a passive matrix LCD screen, which was often quite blurry, didn't have very good contrast, and often was very hard to use, especially when you were trying to use a mouse pointer. Or they would have something like a gas plasma display, which had the, uh, the black on orange um, color scheme or some other color scheme that we used, which gave you better contrast, but again, it certainly wasn't very easy on the eye. So Apple waited until both of those issues could be really resolved to their satisfaction before coming out with the Macintosh Portable. Now, I'm sure that some of you may be thinking at this point, well, the Portable wasn't the first uh, battery-powered uh, Macintosh computer you could buy. And that is technically true, in that some other companies, such as um, Dynamac and um, Outbound, did make their own versions, their own Macintosh clones, if you will, that were designed to run on battery power. But the portable, though, was the very first Apple manufactured battery powered Macintosh. So what Apple decided to do was to release a portable computer, which really didn't have any of the compromises of other portable laptop computers available at the time. But unfortunately, that also resulted in the Macintosh portable being a little bit, well, big and heavy. I think is, there's no other way to put it. So why is that? Well, first of all, with regards to the battery, Apple chose to use a sealed lead acid battery for the portable. So rather than the NICADs that were commonplace at the time, they went with basically a miniature version of a car battery in that sense, although of course a car battery uh, isn't designed to be moved around and, uh, and tipped around and what have you, but it uses the same chemistry internally. Now the advantage of that was that you got exceptional battery life. The Macintosh Portable could run off its battery for upwards of four, five, six hours, in fact, which was outstanding for the time and it's still quite good even by today's standards. And it also meant that Unlike a NICAD, you could top up the battery whenever you needed to without issue, without fear of the memory effect developing because sealed lead acid batteries don't suffer from that. They do have a suffer from another problem with regards to deep discharge, which we'll talk about uh, probably in, in a different, in a separate uh, video. So the battery performance was excellent, but the weight was not. Anyone who's handled a sealed lead acid battery knows that they're not very light, certainly far heavier than a comparable Nike had. And that was one of the issues with the machine, its weight. It weighed, in fact, over seven kilograms, which for a laptop or a, even a portable is, uh, is pretty bad. Then we move on to the screen. What Apple chose to do was to use a then the absolute state of the art in display technology, which was known as an active matrix LCD panel. 
And the idea behind it is that with an active matrix screen, which of course is now universally standard, it, in, it relies on each pixel on the display having its own transistor, its own dedicated transistor to switch it on and off. So rather than the transistors being refreshed in rows and, and columns, as is the way with a passive matrix screen, with active matrix, each pixel is controlled independently. The end result is that you have a screen which is beautifully sharp and does not suffer from any ghosting. And anyone who's tried to use a graphical interface with a, uh, with a mouse pointer on an old passive matrix LCD knows what I'm talking about. If you move the mouse pointer, you, f you lose it. You don't know where it, where it went until you stop moving the mouse and then look for it to come back. The portable did not have that problem, so it was very well suited to a graphical environment. So, some other interesting features of the portable are to do with the pointing device. As you can see, it has a built-in trackball. And again, Apple was watching what was happening in the DOS um, and Windows laptop market, whereby as the popularity of a graphical interface was, as the popularity was improving, more people were using uh, Windows and um, other environments like that, they noticed that laptops didn't have any facility for, or any facility for using a pointing device. You had to, on most laptops, plug in a mouse into the serial port and use that. And of course, if you're in a tight spot, or for example, you're trying to use your laptop on a plane um, or when it's sitting on your lap, that's a bit hard to do. There were some solutions that, were, that, that, came, that people came up with where you could clip on a trackball onto the side, which, which hung over the side of the keyboard, but it didn't really look or work very well. So Apple decided to build the pointing device into the system in the form of a trackball that you can see there. And they also didn't want to compromise on the keyboard either. The keyboard is exactly the same as you would see on a regular Macintosh. The keys are the same size, although the, the layout is a little bit compressed as a result. But they basically did not want the user experience um, to be affected or compromised. So other than that, the Macintosh Portable, you could think of as a, a very fast Macintosh SE in a portable casing with battery power, because that's basically what it was. It had a 16 megahertz, or was it 12 megahertz? Not sure, but I'll, <laughs> it's, it's one of the two. Um, I'll say 16 for the sake of argument. A 16 megahertz, 68,000 CPU, and it came with one megabyte of memory, expandable up to nine megabytes, if you had the right uh, memory expansion card. And it also came with either a single 1.4 megabyte super drive, uh, twin 1.4 meg super drives, or the most popular configuration that I've seen, which was the 1.4 megabyte super drive and the internal 40 megabyte hard disk. <clears throat> So some other details, uh, the Macintosh Portable came out in September of 1989 <clears throat> and was discontinued in February of 1991. And in February of 1991, the Portable was actually revised and replaced with the so-called backlit model, which I'll discuss in a future video. I have one of those as well, which I'll be um, doing a video on. Because the standard Macintosh Portable did not have a backlight for its LCD display, which was probably the main issue really with the machine as a whole, apart from the size and the weight, so that in low light situations, it was very hard to read the screen. But Apple did eventually do something about that with a backlight um, in 1991. So, there's not much else to really say about the Macintosh Portable at this point, so let's go ahead and have a closer look at it. Here's the, the front view of the Macintosh Portable with the screen closed. And as you can see, it has a lot of the same design styling features as the other machines that were around at the time, such as the 2CX and the 2CI. Uh, it has the same colour, has the same horizontal uh, slots on the top. So it, it, was, it, was very, it was styled very much like their desktop machines. So to open up the screen, you have to push on this bar at the front which also doubles as the carrying handle. So if you pull it out, 
This is the carrying handle <clears throat> for the portable. But if you push it back and then push in on it, you can unlatch the screen and it opens up like that. So what do we have here? Well, we've got the screen at the top, we've got the, the carrying handle uh, up here and the, the two latches that lock it down. And if you're wondering what these little cutouts are here, they're actually there to clear the trackball when you close the lid. But you're probably wondering, well, why is there one on each side? Well, it's actually because on the portable, you can actually have the trackball on either the left or the right hand side of the system. And I'll show you how that's done when we take this apart. Then we have the screen itself, which is the exceptionally sharp and clear Active Matrix LCD with a resolution of, I believe it was 640 by 400 resolution. Unfortunately, this does not have a backlight, as mentioned previously, so in low light situations, it can be a little bit hard to read. And we have the, uh, the name tag here, Macintosh Portable. And we have the Apple logo on the other side. And moving down from there, we have the, the keyboard, which is, the, which is a slightly, uh, I think it's a, well, <clears throat> comparing it to the standard Apple keyboard that was around at the time, you can see that it's not, uh, oh, and I just turned on the portable. <laughs> Whoops, turn that off. <laughs> you turn the portable on by pushing any key, so uh, <laughs> should I hook the battery there? But you can see that the layout and the keys themselves are quite similar. And in fact, the size is identical. So unlike some laptops where the manufacturers would slightly shrink the keys to give, to, to allow the laptop itself to be smaller, Apple wanted to keep the key size at, um, at its normal size, which was great for typing. But of course, again, it did add to the bulk of the machine. And over from there, we have the built-in trackball. So with the trackball, of course, not much I, have to, I can say about that, really. It's just a uh, regular trackball that you roll and the mouse button down here. But as I mentioned, you can actually move this, say if you're left-handed, you can move it to the other side of the machine and then move the keyboard across as well. But we'll uh, go into that uh, in a moment. So that's the, uh, that's the front view of the portable. So let me turn it around, we'll have a look at what's on the side. So <clears throat> all we have on this side is the <clears throat> reset and interrupt switches down here, which are hiding down in there, and also a little latch on the right, which actually prevents you from hitting them inadvertently. So if I slide that latch over, then I can't push on these buttons. So there's not much else on that side. So we'll turn it around and we'll look at the other side. So here is the other side and all we have here is the slot for the 1.4 megabyte super drive built in. And if the portable was configured to have two floppy drives, the second one would sit just above it up here. So not much else from the side there, so let's have a look at the back. <clears throat> so here's the back view, and starting from the top we have this little square button here, which is one of the latch releases, so you need to push on that and on this one over here on the other side to release the back cover. Then moving down from there we have all the various ports. So we have a monitor port, which incidentally looks like a standard, <coughs> excuse me, a standard VGA connector, but it actually isn't. I believe you, need, you do need some kind of adapter to hook this up to any type of, of monitor. And I don't believe Apple ever made such an adapter. Not sure, I've never actually seen one in real life. We have an external floppy drive port. 
external SCSI port, security lock there. And if the portable was configured with a built-in modem, then the modem port or the um, telephone jack would be there. ADB port, printer and modem ports, sound out and power in. So that's about all for the exterior of the Macintosh portable. So what we'll do now is we'll take it apart. So here is the Macintosh portable. Now the first step to taking it apart is to remove the rear cover. So to do that, slide it around like this, we push in on the two tabs here and here to release the top cover and we can now remove it. So what do we have here? Well, here's the 40 megabyte hard disk. The floppy drive sits underneath it. We've got the battery that sits in here and here we have all of the various expansion cards if they are so fitted to this model. So the next step would be to remove the battery cover because at this point the battery is still in circuit. There's actually a micro switch that sits just under here which disconnects the battery from the system when you remove this cover. So to remove the cover we have two spring tabs up the front so we carefully push on those and push back to move the cover back and we can lift it out. Now obviously this is not using the original portable battery because they're almost impossible to find and uh, they certainly wouldn't hold the charge um, after being as old as they are. So this is a comparable battery which does the, does the job uh, but I'll be talking a bit more about batteries and, <clears throat> and power adapters for the Macintosh portable in another video. But the, if this machine had the standard battery, it would simply lift straight out of this housing. But this one, I actually have to unplug these, little, these two little connectors here to remove it. So I'll put the battery aside. Now the next step is to take out any of the um, RAM expansion cards or modem cards that might be in here. This one has a modem card, so we'll just carefully rock it back and forth to free it from the slot and pull it straight pull it straight out. There we go, so that's the modem card. The next thing we need to do is to take out the hard disk and the floppy disk drives, but we can't do that until we unhook the cables. As you can see, the cables for the hard disk and floppy disk run underneath the screen here, and actually connected on the other side. So we have to now move across to the front, open it up. We next have to take off the plastic cover for the keyboard. So to do that, we just need to get a, let me just tip it up and I'll show you what I, what I mean. So you can see that we have to put a small screw, oh, no, you can't see on camera. Let me move that. <laughs> That's better. If the portable has these little rubber feet on it, you need to pop the feet off and then insert a small screwdriver into this tab here and this tab here to unhook the keyboard cover. So I'll just I'll quickly do that now. Let's get you back in frame. Uh, Tie the screwdriver that will fit. <coughs> uh, this one will do. <coughs> so if I just <coughs> insert it down here, we can see we've popped up the the keyboard cover and once it's popped off you can remove it. So what we have now <clears throat> is the keyboard, trackball, speaker and we also have the connectors for the battery, the display and for the hard disk and floppy disk. So the next thing we'll do is we might as well take the keyboard and uh, trackball out. So to do that you simply unhook the data connector here, this one over here for the trackball and we'll unplug them from the other side as well to uh, give us some more space. Okay. Now to remove the trackball, 
you simply have to push up on or push back on these two plastic tabs while you pull up on the trackball mechanism. So if you very carefully ease up on it, it will free itself and you can remove the trackball mechanism straight out of the system. It's the same with the keyboard, but because of the number of tabs, you have to be very, very careful and work your way across. So we'll start from the left, pop the tabs as we go, just taking taking care not to break any of them. I would have put too much stress on the keyboard. And there we are, the keyboard is now free and we can remove it. Now, as I mentioned before, you can actually swap the positions of the keyboard and the trackball on the Macintosh Portable. So if you are, for example, left-handed and prefer using a trackball with your left hand, you can actually have it on the left. And all you have to do is simply move this divider over to this side, put the trackball in here, and put the keyboard in here. And then you push down on them to seat them. That's all there is to it. And you can see the data cables still line up, or the, the, the connectors still line up. So it was actually a very clever design. So it's probably the only laptop I've ever come across that has a, uh, a pointing device that can be relocated within the casing. Of course, remember that for later model Macintosh laptops, they put the trackball in the center, so there was no issue with having it on the left or the right. So we'll put, take that away, put that over there. What we'll do now is we'll now unhook the connectors here for the battery. Let's move that out of the way. For the display, for the, this is for the hard disk and the floppy disk is just behind it down in there. So we'll just pop that up and it's now free. So we can now go back over here and we can now carefully pull the data cable out for the hard disk. Now to remove the hard disk, there are two plastic clips. There is one over here and there is one back over here. You need to spread them out while carefully lifting up on the drive and it will then lift straight out. Notice on this disk that there is no power cable. We'll talk about this in a little bit, a little bit later, but the hard drive used in the Macintosh Portable was a special model of Connor. See, it's the Connor CP3045, which had a special connector on its mainboard. You can see there is no power connector, but we'll discuss that in a moment. So let's put that aside. The floppy drive is next to come out. Once the data cable has been freed, you just lift up on it to remove it. And this is a standard 1.4 megabyte Apple SuperDrive mechanism, so you can interchange this with other models of Mac that have the SuperDrive. Okay, now there's not much else to do here. Now at this point, you can remove the display housing um, by simply sliding off these two clutch covers and then pulling this pin up and then removing the clutch cover, but we won't do that here. What we'll do is we'll simply remove the entire system chassis from the case. So you can see that this section here that the battery sits in, um, the drive sit in, and the display is connected to is actually a separate housing from the actual back panel or the, the under, the under, the uh, the bottom panel. So to take it out, we have to go back here. Uh, we'll also remove the speaker at this point. We'll just unplug that and we'll move this little tab over here to pop, oh, there's a tab over here to pop that speaker out. Now you can see here that we have a tab over here, we have a tab here, and we have a tab over here. And what you do is you pop each of these tabs, you release the tabs, and then you can actually hinge this assembly up and remove it from the, the bottom board or the bottom panel. So we'll start with this clip over here. Just carefully pop that. You can see it, the, the uh, chassis raises a little bit. And then this clip here, you push in on this to release it. It will pop up and then you can release this clip here and it pops up. So you can see when all those three clips free you can take the whole display and bottom 
um, chassis assembly out and all you're left with is the bottom panel. So this is what we're left with. So the next step is to remove the logic board from the chassis. Now to do that, we'll just close that, we'll tip it upside down so you can see. So the logic board is secured to the chassis with plastic clips that run along the sides and the top and then hooks at the bottom. So to remove the logic board you simply start from one corner, you carefully move these little clips, carefully move these little clips out of the way. It's a bit hard to do this one-handed. Um, I'm holding the, oh there we go. Okay, and then we keep, just pop these off carefully. Don't bend these clips too far because they will break. Now this one there, I didn't get. And now, the logic board is now free from the system. So, we'll put the system chassis away. So now we'll have a closer look at the logic board. Now, it actually occurred to me we should have a closer look at the, the bottom panel of the Macintosh Portable as well because, I don't know if the camera's picking this up here, but the casing is actually inscribed or moulded in with signatures of all of the design team. So there, there are their names, product design team, all the people there, but if you move around you can see all of their signatures, which is, uh, which is quite neat. <laughs> How many have we got here? Uh, oh, there's another one. Oh, I might try and get this, fix this focus. Oh, come on, focus, focus. That's better. Problem is, of course, it's very hard to tell what the names actually are. But it's quite neat that they're all moulded into the uh, bottom panel. <laughs> a lot of people worked on the Macintosh Portable. Hmm. Hmm. It's quite, uh, quite neat. <laughs> <laughs> obviously very proud of their achievement and I can see why. We'll also have a quick look at the other side of this uh, bottom panel to show you the information on the label. So here's the underside of the bottom panel and here is the information label. Macintosh Portable, model number M1520 which denotes that it is the original non-backlit version. I think the M1520, M5126 was the backlit version. Various certifications assembled in USA. In fact, it's worth noting that I'll, I'll try and, oh, here we go, copyright 1989 Apple computer. It's worth noting, in fact, there was actually a video on YouTube that was a promotional video that Apple made showing off their US um, assembly facility and you actually see them the production process for the logic boards and the logic boards that they happen to be making when they shot the video were actually for the Macintosh portable so I'll, I'll put a, a link in the video here to take you to it um, so it's actually quite neat to, sh to see that to see these particular boards actually being made and in fact in the video they they in fact they make the whole board on site, as in they do all of the, um, I think the boards are shipped in, but all the components are placed there on site, um, all the soldering is done on site, and all the all the testing is done on site. But it's a shame that actually don't show you, show them assembling the portable itself. They only show the circuit board, but I think it's still quite uh, quite neat. Here's the logic board out of the Macintosh portable, so we'll have a closer look at it, starting from the top. 
we have all the various ports as you can see we also have the uh, some various components I believe that's the charging uh, MOSFET transistor there Q1 there's some various other, other various components there so I have recapped this board which is why some of the capacitors look a bit um, a little odd there's some various other components there it's probably the board's serial number there more ports up there and moving down we've got probably the sound chips there uh, the SWIM that's the floppy controller there SCSI controller there here are the slots this is the processor direct slot here J12 which from what I understand was only ever used for accelerator boards but I don't know if any were ever made for the portable may have been I've never seen any but um, that's probably what that board would have been that slot would have been used for next to it we have the RAM expansion slot here J11 and this takes a special um, a special uh, memory expansion card which unfortunately I don't have with me but uh, you can expand the portables memory by plugging a special card into that slot to take it up to I think um, I think they made them up to eight megabytes in capacity so you'd get a total of nine megabytes um, but normally I think most of the ones I've seen are only a one megabyte card taking the portable up to two megabytes of memory we have the ROM slot over here now again this I only know of one use for this slot which was a special kit that Apple released for the Macintosh portable, the original portable, which allowed you to upgrade it to the backlit screen that was used on the later Macintosh portable. But the kit included not only a new screen, but also a new card that connected into the ROM slot because the active matrix display had a different connector. So apparently you had to install a special card to make it work in the old in the original portable so that's what the ROM slot would have been for modem slot there for a modem card which I, I have one so we'll go through that a little bit later and then we have the built-in memory over here so the portable has one megabyte of memory on board but it's worth noting this is this is not just any old type of memory I don't know if the code will be showing up there but this is in fact known as static RAM SRAM it's not dynamic RAM now the reason it was chosen by Apple was that dynamic RAM has to be refreshed every so often to preserve its contents and doing so for a battery powered system is not a good idea because of course the system is having to use more power to keep the memory refreshed while it's running. Static RAM does not require that. You basically can set the contents of static RAM but no refreshing is required. So for a battery powered system it makes a lot of sense but it was very expensive and that's one of the reasons um, the portable was so expensive in its day um, but certainly using static RAM certainly did help the battery life so we've got one megabyte of memory there so moving on from there we have uh, various other chips CPU glue logic the main CPU the Motorola 68000 running it looks like 12 megahertz <laughs> Not 16 as I originally thought. Actually, how fast was the clock crystal? That'll tell me. Uh, I can't quite see what that is. Let me have a closer look at it. Oop, focus. Uh, doesn't want to focus. Um, right, well, the clock crystal is at 31.3 megahertz, so it would be, in fact, just under 16 megahertz in terms of its speed but strangely enough the chip as you can see is marked as a 68,000 FN 12 FN FN 12 it I don't know maybe maybe Motorola found that these CPUs would support 16 megahertz operation <laughs> not sure but anyhow let's move on video controller chip there um, not sure what that is. Being a Sony chip, it may be the uh, may be the um, the sound chip, possibly. Uh, PMGR. This is the power manager chip. This is the chip that controls the charging and the battery on the portable. 
it's basically there to monitor the status of the battery and trigger the low battery warnings and also give you the nice little battery gauge that tells you how much charge is left in the battery. Okay, a via chip there, another glue logic chip there. SCC, I believe that's a serial controller there. The two disc floppy drive connectors, because remember that the portable could support two floppy drives. Um, now, I must admit, I have no idea what this bank of dip switches does. I've been told not to mess with them because apparently that can damage the machine, but I'm curious as to know what it was for and what, what the different settings were. So if anyone knows, please, uh, please let me know. But anyhow, <laughs> some more voltage regulators there. And the, that's the I.O. device connector. That can be either for the tr trackball or for the keyboard. And there's another one of those, of course, on the other side over here. Uh, what else have we got? Keyboard controller there. SCSI connector for the internal drive there. Display connector there. Power connector there. Some more voltage regulators. And I'm not entirely sure what this board is. It's labelled as hybrid. Not sure what it does, though. Hmm. Hmm. Not sure. Oh, reset interrupt switches, of course, over here. So that is the logic board out of the Macintosh portable. So let's have a quick look at the modem card that came with it. Get that out of here. Oh, stand up. <laughs> this is the modem card. This would have been your standard probably 2400 board modem, um, which course for 1989 was um, was about the best you could get. <laughs> How times have changed. So we've got some uh, clock crystal here. Control. I think that's, I think that's National Semiconductor. I think that uh, is it. No, it's not. That's um, oh, I don't remember who uh, who makes those chips with that logo. But <laughs> it'll come to me. Uh, okay, other controllers there. The line transformer, relays, connector for the phone jack. This is the ROM, copyright 1991 Applied Engineering, and the connector down here that interfaces with the Portables logic board. Hmm, well, not much to really uh, see there. <laughs> Let's have a closer look now at the special hard disk that came with the Portable. So, Apple claimed that with the Macintosh Portable they used a special low power hard disk. Now I'm sure that's true because the hard disk they used was a unique model for the portable and as I mentioned before it has a unique type of connector. So let's have a look at the drive. So it is a Connor peripheral CP3045 and you can see that 250 milliamps at 12 volts, 275 milliamps at 5 volts which is pretty good for a three and a half inch hard disk, at least it was back then. Um, some various markings there as to the uh, probably the date of manufacture. I'm not quite sure. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, there's the Apple label, hard disk 40SC. And if we have a look at the actual connector, I might hold it for this one. You can see focus. Come on, focus. <laughs> you can see that it's a special connector which handles both the data and the power. So replacing this drive can be a little tricky and you will need some kind of adapter cable to be made up, which you can do. There are instructions on the net for doing that, but thankfully this is the original drive and it still seems to work just fine. Okay, so that's about all we have on the Macintosh Portable. So stay tuned for the next video when I'll be when I'll reassemble the portable. We'll power it up, and we'll demonstrate the system software and a couple of applications that I have. So thank you for watching, and stay tuned for part two. <laughs>